Hello all. The nursery rhyme we're going to unpick today is practically made for this channel. The cowardly philanderer Georgie Porgy. There are three main suspects as to who Georgie was, all of them English, not all of them called Georgie. George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. Or King Charles II, you may have spotted he's not called George, I'll explain that later. Or perhaps George IV. The rhyme as we know it today goes like this. Georgie Porgy Pudding and Pie kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. The earliest version in print is found in the very odd collection of rhymes and tales called the Kentish Coronal from 1841, but with not insignificant change that it was when the girls came out to play that Georgie Porgy ran away. The boys don't get a mention. The rhyme is used as a satire on the poets of the day, with a very tongue-in-cheek idea that Georgie Porgy dates from the reign of Charlemagne in the 8th century. The version in which the girls come out to play is also seen in Kate Greenaway's Mother Goose Rhymes from 1881, and Rudyard Kipling quotes it in 1891 when he wrote a story of a man whose friends gave him the nickname Georgie Porgy. Nevertheless, in the new book of old rhymes published in 1894, it was the boys who were making Georgie run away, and it may well be that both versions were recited at the same time. It wasn't just Georgie Porgy who was making unwanted advances. James Orchard Hallowell, the first person to create a systematic history of nursery rhymes, recorded in 1851 that Roly-Poly at Pumpkin Pie kissed the girls and made them cry. When the girls began to cry, Roly-Poly ran away. So what can we make of all this? Well, the rhyme seems to be well known by the mid-19th century, and clearly almost anyone named George could be a candidate for being Porgy. If we discount the idea that it's just a nonsense verse, the most plausible theory is that it was a satire on someone known as Georgie Porgy, or Roly-Poly, who was prominent in English society between the 16th and 19th century. If we explore the possible candidates chronologically, the first option is George Villiers, first Duke of Buckingham. Coming from minor nobility, he was born in 1892 and entered the royal court of James I in 1614 at the age of 21. He was sponsored by the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Earl of Pembroke, who sought to exploit his good looks to win favour with the sexually ambiguous king. The plan worked, and soon George was James's new favourite. According to the Bishop of Gloucester, Villiers was the handsomest bodied man in England, his limbs so well compacted, and his conversation so pleasing, and of so sweet a disposition. So, he wasn't really eating too many puddings or pies. Speculation as to James's sexuality remains to this day, and he clearly held Buckingham in very high regard, telling his court, You may be sure that I love Buckingham more than anyone else. Villiers, for his part, signed off his letters to the king, your humble slave, servant, and dog. But his sexuality was not that ambiguous. He still had time to marry and have children. His elevation from minor nobility to duke, and his influence over the king, caused resentment at court. Whether this led to a satirical rhyme about kissing girls while playing with boys, we can't be sure. As James aged and became more frail, George's attention shifted to his son and heir apparent Charles, later Charles I. Charles certainly wasn't interested in boys, and when the two men travelled to Spain in a misguided bid to finalise Charles's marriage with a Spanish infanta, Buckingham adopted a flamboyantly heterosexual image and acquired a reputation for womanising, as shown in this painting by Peter Paul Rubens. Following a series of military disasters while Lord Admiral, Buckingham became increasingly unpopular at court and with the public, and we know a series of ballads were written framing him as effeminate, cowardly and corrupt. Georgie Porgy may well have been one of these. His end was swift. He was assassinated at the age of 35 by a disgruntled army officer in a pub in Portsmouth. So was George Villiers the original Georgie Porgy? Well, perhaps, but there are other candidates. The next theory uses the roly-poly version of the rhyme. Today, the term roly-poly sometimes is used in Britain as a rather rude way of describing a rotund boy, and is the name of a sweet suet pudding, but in the 17th century, it was the term for a scoundrel, and this may be the basis of the rhyme. Old Rowley was a nickname for Charles II, the grandson of James I. Old Rowley was applied to the king as a satire on the fact that, while he hadn't managed to father a legitimate heir with his wife, Catherine of Braganza, he had at least twelve illegitimate children by seven mistresses. 
While Charles was largely popular in his day, there was some resentment over the fact that taxes were spent on his mistresses and children, and a series of satirical poems are written as a result, such as Restless he rolls from whore to whore, a merry monarch, scandalous and poor. I suppose the verse roly-poly may have developed at the same time. The result of Charles's affairs is still evident in the nobility and royal family today. The present Dukes of Buckleu, Richmond, Grafton, and St. Albans are descendants of his illegitimate offspring, as was Diana, Princess of Wales, and ironically, Queen Camilla. The third possible Georgie Porgy is someone who definitely did like puddings and pies, which you sort of feel is a prerequisite for being Georgie Porgy. God, I've said Porgy so many times now. George the Fourth who was Prince Regent from 1811 until he ascended the throne in his own right in 1820, reigned for ten years. George enjoyed a flamboyant and luxurious lifestyle and was satirised for his womanising and weight, which peaked at over 17 stone, his enormous waist measuring 50 inches. Like Charles II, George enjoyed kissing the girls. At 21, he became infatuated with Maria Fitzherbert, a commoner six years his elder, who was twice widowed, and on top of all of that, a Roman Catholic, and as such, under the Act of Settlement, they couldn't officially marry. But the couple went through an unofficial wedding ceremony in December 1785. Under pressure from the government and his father, George ended the relationship in 1794 and married his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick, in exchange for writing off some of his debts. So by ending one official marriage and entering an official marriage, which was famously unhappy, the girls certainly did cry. George went on to have innumerable mistresses and almost certainly illegitimate children. He was ridiculed by the satirists of the day for being vacuous and cowardly. There's some speculation that when the boys came out to play and Georgie Porgy ran away refers to an incident when George attended an illegal bare-knuckle boxing match. But when one of the fighters died, George fled the scene. I can't find any evidence for this event having taken place. And as I noted earlier, the version of the rhyme we know from the mid-19th century doesn't mention any boys. There's a romantic, if rather tragic, twist to the tale. George retained his love for Maria Fitzherbert, and on his deathbed placed a letter from her under his pillow, and requested that her eye miniature be placed around his neck after his death. If I had to put money on one of the theories, I'd go for George the Fourth. But what do you think? Well, I hope you enjoyed this short video of pie-eating adultery. If you did, please do press the like button and consider subscribing to be notified of new videos. Bye for now.